Well, welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorin Trudor. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Uh, this online pro program is part of a regular series that I've been doing, as you may know, that looks in particular at individual objects and photographs in our collection as a way to explore our museum's holdings. Before we start, I want to emphasize that our building is open to the public. So if you're inspired by this program or some of the other ones I've done, I hope you'll come to our museum and take a look at these objects and images in person. We're open on Monday through Friday from 10 to 4.30 and Saturday and Sunday from noon to four, although we will be closed for on Monday for Labor Day and on next Tuesday and Wednesday for the Jewish New Year. One last comment before we get going, just a, um, an appeal or if you have questions, of course, an encouragement, that's what I want, an encouragement to pose any questions or comments you have using the Q&A feature of Zoom and I will make sure to make time at the end of my presentation to look at them. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the Fahrenwald Displaced Persons Camp using this picture as a launching point. I wanna give a bit of background to the DP camps that were established after World War II. I also wanna talk specifically about Fahrenwald, and I wanna talk about one survivor, George Oscar Lee, who established the fire brigade at Fahrenwald that's shown here. And here he is at the center of the photograph. He later settled on Long Island. Before I go further, let me also thank George Oscar Lee's daughter, Phyllis, and son, Mitchell, for sharing their family history with me uh, when I prepared for this presentation. I also wanna thank Lillian Gewurzman, a survivor who put together a wonderful exhibit at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center a number of years ago that drew on the experiences and recollections of George Oscar Lee, among others who spent time in the DP camps. The photograph that I'm talking about today is actually part of a, a large section in our museum dedicated to the DP camps. And I should add that it is only one of several photographs and items in our museum from Fahrenwald. I'll come back in a minute to talk about why this camp was so well photographed, but of course, it was only one of hundreds of displaced persons camps set up by the Allies in the wake of the war. You can see on this map that shows how these camps were spread out throughout Germany and Austria in the Allied occupation zones, also into Italy. The yellow area is the British zone, green French, blue is American, and the red is the Soviet sector. These were camps that were administered by the Allies and the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, the UNRRA. They also received support from aid organizations like the Organization for Rehabilitation Through Training, ORT or ORT, and the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the Joint. These camps were initially set up to house some of the 11 million people who were displaced from their homes at the end of the war. They included not just the Jewish survivors from concentration camps, but former prisoners of war, released slave laborers, and non-Jewish concentration camp survivors as well. But they became, the displaced persons camp, particularly important for the Jewish survivors of the war who had no homes to return to, who had lost most of or all of their families, and who needed a temporary home while they waited to get approval to emigrate out of Europe. Many survivors wanted to move in particular to Palestine, which in 1945 was still under British authority until the formation of the State of Israel in 1948. They also wanted to move to America. But the British and the Americans continued to restrict immigration after the war, forcing the survivors to remain in the DP camps until they received the necessary visa approvals. By the middle of 1947, some 250,000 Jews were housed in DP camps awaiting legal immigration to a new home. While they waited, the survivors started to rebuild their lives in these DP camps, creating flourishing communities out of the remnant of the Jewish population of Europe. I mentioned before that this photograph is from Fahrenwald which became both because of its size, serving as a home to 4,000 people in its early years, and its length of service, 
it became known as one of the more well-known DP camps. It was established in the German town or near the German town of Wolfratshausen, about 25 miles south of Munich in the American zone of occupied Germany. Most of the buildings had been built in 1939 to house employees of IG Farben, the German chemical conglomerate, although other structures had been put up during the war to house forced slave laborers. The Americans opened the DP camp in 1945, June 1945. Several things about Fahrenwald are worth mentioning, I think. First, like most of the DP camps, Fahrenwald was initially set up to house a range of different displaced persons. So not just Jews, not just former Nazi prisoners. And initially, Holocaust survivors were not treated any differently in Fahrenwald or in the other DP camps than other displaced persons. Yet, yes, they were given the, the medical care that they needed, but there was no recognition by the Allies that the Jews had gone through something entirely different than the other victims during the war. Planners, at least initially, did not want to repeat the separation of Jews from the wider public, nor did they want to reinforce the idea that Jews were the other. Pretty quickly, however, the Allies realized that there were significant reasons why Jewish survivors should be separated from other displaced persons. And the document that brought that need into sharp focus was the Harrison Report of August of 1945, a document I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I spoke about the Feldafing camp. In June of 1945, Harry Truman commissioned Earl Harrison to tour the displaced persons camps and assess if the needs of Jews in particular in the camps were being met. Harrison had recently been chosen as the Dean of UPenn Law School in 1945, but had served in several government positions, including most recently at the time, as the Commissioner of Immigration and Naturalization. So he's well familiar with the issues and the needs of uh, relating to immigration. His report submitted in 1945 was direct and strongly worded. He described the poor living conditions, unheated buildings, barbed wire fences, and the continued reliance on the concentration camp clothing. But he wrote of a more basic need. He said the first and plainest needs of the people is recognition of their actual status. And by this, I mean their status as Jews. Refusal to recognize the Jews as such has the effect in this situation of closing one's eyes to their former and more barbaric persecution. He closed the report with a particularly damning section writing, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we don't exterminate them. We're, they are in concentration camps, in large numbers under our military guard instead of SS troops. One is led to wonder whether the German people seeing this are not supposing that we are following or at least condoning Nazi policy. One response to the report was to create separate camps specifically for Jews, where their status as the particular victims of Nazi policies was recognized and where Jewish life was actively encouraged. Fahrenwald was changed to a strictly Jewish camp in October of 1945, and one which when compared to many of the other camps had some of the better housing uh, with small, solidly built and centrally heated homes. And the residents of Fahrenwald established a whole range of community organizations and services. There were schools and vocational training, there was also a theater, a hospital, sports teams, a newspaper. There, was, there were community institutions to maintain order, like a local court, a local police department, and a local fire brigade. And here you can see the caption that we include with this photograph in our museum. And you can also see the men in their uniforms complete with helmets and the gas-powered water pump that they used to put out fires. <clears throat> Actually, both the fire brigade and the police department in Fahrenwald were established by George Oscar Lee, whose energy and dedication helped make Fahrenwald a notably safer community. Here you see a photograph of the Fahrenwald police in a formal march, and you may recognize, there he is on the front line, George Oscar Lee. Similarly, here you can see a collage of the members of the fire brigade and a closer look shows you 
George Oscar Lee as the chief. George Oscar Lee described how he started the fire brigade using an amusing anecdote, but in reality, the explanation was tied to his longer personal history. His short version was that on his second day in Fahrenwald, he heard a woman yelling fire from inside one of the houses. He ran into the home, quickly doused the fire, then found out that the camp had no fire department. Seeing a need, he asked permission to establish one, which was granted, and he went on to choose and train a squad of men. There's no reason to doubt any part of that story, but there is much more to it. By 1945, when George Oscar Lee arrived at Fahrenwald, he had a world of experience and it actually served as a trained fireman uh, himself. He was born Oscar Littmann in Drohobitz, Poland on September 1st, 1924. So today would have been his 97th birthday. Much later, when he moved to the United States, he changed his name to George Oscar Lee. Drohobitz was a city of some 40,000 people in, in 1930, including about 15,000 Jews, but it was also home to one of Europe's oldest salt mines and had developed into one of the largest oil refining centers in Europe. Today, it's part of the Ukraine, but in 1924, it was part of Poland, about 50 miles southwest from the larger Polish city of Lvov, now the Ukrainian city of Lviv. On September 1st, 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland from the west, and then on September 17th, the Soviet army invaded from the east. Based on prior agreement, the Poland was then divided among these two powers with Drohobitz and the larger city of Lvov falling into the Soviet section. As September 1st today obviously marks not only George Oscar Lee's birthday, but the uh, anniversary of the opening of World War II with that invasion by the Nazis into Poland. It must have been a difficult day for George Oscar Lee 97 years ago. In June of 1941, the Nazis, unsatisfied with just their portion of Poland, invaded the Soviet Union and quickly moved to take control of the oil, oil refineries in Drohobitz. With the threat of Nazi invasion, George and his father, Jacob, rushed with Jacob's sister, Helen, and her husband, Abe, who was well-connected politically, onto a train that took them east into Russia. George's mother and his sister decided to stay in Drohobitz, thinking that the, the, the Germans would leave the women alone as they had done during World War I. In the end, George and his family traveled close to 2,000 miles to the east, well east of Moscow, into the Ural Mountains. There, George's father, who was 48 at the time, was deemed too old to serve in the army and so went to work in a tractor factory. George, who was only 16, was too young for the army and was instead assigned to work in the fire brigade, brigade filling the place of some of the able-bodied men who had gone to fight. It was there in the town of Krasnufinsk that he underwent a rigorous training as a fireman before being arrested for six months held by the NKVD, Stalin's secret police. When he was finally released from prison, he enlisted in the Polish division of the Red Army and served in an anti-aircraft battalion that helped liberate Warsaw and then continued fighting all the way to Berlin. After the war, George Oscar Lee returned to Drohobit to find that his sister and his mother had both been murdered by the Nazis. Believing they would have a better life for him and his family and four other family members, they smuggled themselves across the Czech border and into Germany, arriving at the Fahrenwald DP camp on October 10th, 1945. While he had suffered the loss of his family members and endured starvation brought upon by Stalinist policies during the war, George Ashkali had not experienced the atrocities of a Nazi concentration camp. He arrived at Fahrenwald just after his 21st birthday as a strong, handsome, confident young man who had managed to survive based on his wits and cunning. He also brought his experience from both military service and the fire brigade as a leader of men and he leapt into the Fahrenwald community. 
This is another picture of the fire brigade led by George. And I think you can see in this picture, the confidence and pride that being part of this group gave to this group of survivors. The fire brigade and the police certainly became crucial to the safety of the camp, but they also were a way that George shared his confidence and helped inspire those around him. Let me share one other photograph of George from his time at Farenwald. This is actually one of my favorite photographs. Uh, it was in the temporary exhibition about the displaced persons camps created by Lillian DeWertzman. And it shows George in his alpine sweater, ski sweater, made by some of the women in Farenwald from the mops that had been sent as cleaning supplies to the camp. The Americans sent these cleaning supplies. The folks in Farenwald said, we can do something more with these mops and made the sweaters. And then they made their own brooms and brushes out of other materials. Um, I love the photo because it shows really a dashing and handsome young George Oscar Lee, but it also shows the creativity and entre entrepreneurial spirit that emerged in the DP camp from the women who made this amazing sweater. George ended up staying at the Farenwald DP camp for three years, waiting to get his visa to come to the United States. In 1947, after two years of waiting, the rest of his family that had come to Germany with him gave up on the hope of getting into the United States and instead moved to Israel, along with about half of all Jewish DP camp residents. George waited another year and finally got the approval he needed, thanks in part to some cousins who had moved to America well before the war. After coming to America, he married a survivor that he had met at Farenwald. They raised two children in the New York area and made a life for themselves. Later, he retired in Nassau County. I should add that in his retirement, George embraced the urge to write down some of what he remembered and published five books. If you're interested, his book entitled Russian Saga is a collection of short stories that largely come from his own life experiences. And you can find it in our library at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center in Glen Cove. When he left Farenwald in 1948, it was only one year away from the closure, the projected closure of Farenwald. Although in the end, due to various other factors, Farenwald stayed open well past 1949. It actually served as a home for the folks who had been forced out of DP camps that had closed. And finally, lasted until 1957, serving for 12 years as the home for Jews who had no place to go. Farenfold lasting until 1957 when it was closed down. Many of the buildings, however, remain. And indeed, George Oscar Lee's daughter, Phyllis, was inspired by a visit there the remains of the camp, and the comments she heard from her parents and other survivors to make a documentary film about Camp Farnball entitled After the Final No. And I'll just put in a plug for her. If you have information about the displaced persons camp at Farnball, please reach out to Phyllis Lee using the email address here on the screen. She would be eager to hear stories of family members or see photographs or get other financial backers for her film. We are honored to have the photograph of George Oscar Lee's fire brigade in our exhibition about Farenwald and other DP camps. It provides one window into the DP camps where survivors began to recover and restart their lives. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you for watching. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and I'll try to answer them. Let me also put in a little bit of an advertisement for some of our other upcoming programs. On Tuesday, September 14th at 6 p.m., please join me for a discussion with Professor Leah Garrett about her wonderful new book, X Troop, The Secret Jewish Commandos of World War II. The book focuses on the actions of a group of Jewish commandos that for various reasons had been swept under the rug of history. But I hope you'll join us to learn about her research and the amazing stories she has. I will be back for my next Curator's Corner on Wednesday, September 15th, when I will talk about the Aryanization process, looking in particular at a Jewish-owned store in Frankfurt, which was sold under duress to a non-Jewish owner as part of the Nazi effort to get the Jews to leave Germany in the 1930s. And one more program to mention, 
on Wednesday, September 22nd, HMTC is holding a fashion show and luncheon at the Pine Hollow Club. We have tickets available, and if you're interested in coming to support HMTC and on having a lovely afternoon, I hope you will join us. You can find details about how to purchase tickets for the fashion show and the full list of our upcoming programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org. And I hope that you'll also click the Give Now button on our website and make a donation to support our programs. Okay, let me stop sharing, sharing my screen and instead, oops, uh, and instead answer your questions. I see a few have come in. How many Jews were in the camp? So uh, Fahrenwald at its highest point reached 4,000 Jews living in Fahrenwald, uh, but overall there were some 250,000 Jews in the various different DP camps by 1947. I think that's the date. Uh, by then, most of the non-Jews had moved out back to homes and back to uh, other locations, but the Jewish uh, former prisoners were the ones who stayed the longest. Uh, partially because of opposition to letting them into various countries. Uh, another question, do you know if the people in the different DP camps socialized and are communicated with each other while they were staying in the different camps? Um, there was certainly some communication between different DP camps. Um, there were some, you know, you could travel between them too, but there you had to get a various approvals. Um, so yeah, there was communication, certainly, the, it was obviously a, a major focus right after the war for people to find each other's family members. And so people in different DP camps were looking to find each other. So yes, there were, certainly was uh, communication and some socialization between them. Uh, another question, I met and interacted with Henry Cohen a few times in the mid nineties. He was the head of the camp for half a year when he was only 24 years old. I had him speak at a commemorative program in the mid nineties. His most memorable and painful memory was when Henry confiscated boxes full of tefillin and sephorim for a noted Hasid, Hasidic Rebbe, uh, the Klusenberger Rebbe. The Rebbe had them donated by his fellow Hasidim in the United States. That's an interest. I'd, I'd love to learn more about that and why were they? Why was he confiscating these? Um, why the tefillin? I, there certainly was religious worship allowed in the camps. Oh, uh, I see. He's saying Henry Cohen had them confiscated so they could be distributed to all people, not just in this one camp. Yeah, I can understand the, the difficulty there. Um, okay, well, thanks everybody for joining me and I look forward to seeing you at other programs soon. I, I wish you a, a wonderful afternoon. Take care.